Hey guys, this is Anthony Morganti. I am MrPhotographer.com. In this video, I want to talk about exposure as it pertains to post-processing. Now, there's tons of great videos, books, and articles on exposure, but most of those are talking about how to achieve proper exposure when you're out taking pictures. There's also a lot of great technical information on your specific camera telling you how to use the different exposure modes in your camera. Well, when you think about it, all of that really boils down to a file. At the end of the day, you're going to have a file and you're going to need to process that file. It could be a raw file, it could be a JPEG. Nonetheless, you're going to have a file. And I don't think a lot of photographers take into account what they need to do in post-production when they're out taking a photo. And I'm going to try to explain that in this video and it will became, become more clear, hopefully, as I go along. First of all, let's talk about a couple of different terms. The first term I'm sure you've heard is called dynamic range. A scene is said to have some dynamic range. Basically, wherever you're pointing your camera, whatever you're framing up, that has dynamic range. And dynamic range is the ratio between the brightest part in that scene and the darkest part in that scene. So if you have a scene that has a lot of very bright parts and a lot of very dark parts and a lot of parts in between, that scene is, to have, is said to have a lot of dynamic range. On the other hand, if you're pointing your camera at a scene and the ratio between the brightest part and the darkest part is very low, so there isn't really anything exceedingly bright compared to what is exceedingly dark, that scene is said to have low dynamic range. For example, if you point your camera at a solid blue wall, that wall is painted light blue, like very, very light blue, and you point your camera and you're framing that up that scene has low dynamic range. Same thing for a very dark blue wall. If you're pointing your camera at that very dark blue wall, again, that scene has very low dynamic range because the ratio between the brightest part and the darkest part is very low, zero, one to one. Uh, so those scenes have low dynamic range. On the other hand, if you have a wall that is painted half light blue, and half dark blue, that scene has more dynamic range because the ratio between the lightest part and darkest part is greater than either of the other two examples. So that's dynamic range. Dynamic range is the scene. Now the camera, as it relates to the luminance values, that is called exposure latitude. Now a lot of people will talk about a camera and they'll say this camera has great dynamic range. Well that's not a right way to put it. Uh, although everyone will probably understand what you're talking about, it's still not correct. The scene has dynamic range. The camera has exposure latitude. The exposure latitude of a camera is how well can it record the brightest parts with detail as well as how well it could record the darkest parts with detail. So one that could go really, really bright and record detail into that very, very bright area while at the same time recording the very, very dark and keep the detail in that dark area, that camera is said to have a lot of exposure latitude. On the other hand, <laughs> in the early days of digital photography, cameras didn't have a lot of exposure latitude. And you had to be very careful that you didn't uh, expose it in such a way, like drastically underexpose the scene because you would lose all the detail in the shadows or drastically overexpose the scene because then you would lose all the detail in the highlights and there was no way to get it back. So you had to be very careful. Today, cameras are much better. They have much greater exposure latitude. Now, if you shoot film, uh, instead of the camera having exposure latitude, film has exposure latitude. If you're shooting negative film, it has an amount of exposure latitude. And those of us that shot negative film a lot back in the day, those that are older, or at least into film photography today, they'll tell you that you had to be very careful with negative film, that you didn't underexpose it because it would lose detail in the shadows and there was no way in the dark room for you to get that detail back. On the other hand, if you shot slide film, it was the exact opposite. You had to be very careful 
about overexposing it because slide film would lose detail in the highlights very easily and quickly. So when we shot film, quite often we would overexpose it just a little bit if we had a di high dynamic range scene because we knew that that film could retain the detail in the highlights better than it could retain the detail in the shadows. If we were shooting, the sli shooting slide film, we had to think in that opposite way. We had to probably underexpose it just a little bit to make sure that we didn't uh, blow out the highlights because we knew we could retain that, uh, that data in the shadows better with slide film as opposed to negative film. So uh, exposure latitude was a term that really is from the days of film that got carried over to digital. Now, what I'm talking about and I want to try to make everyone aware of is when you're out taking photos, you should take into account what you want to achieve in post-production when you're trying to determine, quote, and I'm using air quotes, the proper exposure. Because the proper exposure really is relative. It's relative to the scene and it's relative to you. What are you going for? For example, if you're photographing a waterfall, you could use a shutter speed, let's say, of 1 1,000th one of a second with a corresponding ISO and aperture to get a perfectly exposed scene. On the other hand, you could take that same scene, uh, same day, everything, and use, let's say, a shutter speed of 2 seconds with a corresponding ISO and aperture to get, again, proper exposure. So you have two images that are properly exposed. But most people would probably prefer the image that has the two-second exposure because they want the water blurred. So they both have proper exposure, but one is better than the other. Now, as far as if you're just out taking photos, take a look at this shot, just a mundane shot. I was waiting for my coffee, a little coffee shop over here to the left. And it's a pour over, so it took some time. And I went over here. And I took this shot down, looking right down Main Street in Buffalo. And if you look at the histogram, you could see that the tones are pretty well distributed right across the histogram. Now, there is a spike in the blue channel right here, but that's because we have a lot of blue sky relative to the other uh, channels in the shot. So we have a spike over on the right. But overall, you could see that it's pretty well distributed across the histogram. So this is... Again, air quotes, proper exposure. This shot is two stops underexposed. And if you look at the histogram, you could see it's built up over on the left. So we have a lot of the tones are dark. This is said, or the term is exposed to the left. There are some instances when you would want to expose to the left. If you're a landscape photographer and you have a lot of expanse of blue sky, with a lot of fluffy white clouds, you knowing that a digital camera could retain detail into the shadows much better than it can retain detail into the highlights, even if you have a great camera with a lot of exposure latitude, you still may underexpose it just a little bit to make sure that you're not going to blow out those white clouds so that you have detail throughout those white clouds. So in, it, when you're out taking pictures, you're thinking about post-production and you're thinking, I want to make sure I have detail in those clouds when I process this image. So I'm going to underexpose it a little bit. Now you're not going to probably underexpose it two stops, but you're going to underexpose it a little bit. But there's a detriment to underexposing a digital image, and that is noise. The more an image is underexposed, the more you'll introduce, introduce noise into the shot, especially in the shadows. So that's a trade-off, and you have to take that into account. Noise is going to be increased. It's going to be higher in an underexposed image than a properly exposed image. Now, if we go to the other side, this image is two stops overexposed. Now, there may be a situation when you would want to overexpose a shot ever so slightly, not two stops necessarily, but let's say that you're doing some macro work and you need high detail in that macro shot. You don't want to uh, enhance the noise by having it underexposed. Even properly exposed might have a little more noise uh, 
than a slightly overexposed shot. So if you're taking a photo that needs a lot of detail retained in it in post-production, you may want to overexpose it just a little bit. The thing you gotta be careful though, is that if you overexpose it too much, you're going to lose detail in the brightest parts. You're going to blow out the highlights. Now, if you look at the histogram here, you can see how it's all pushed over to the right. This is said to expose to the right. So if you're exposing to the right, you're overexposing the shot. If you expose to the left, you're underexposing the shot. And there are situations where each will come into play and you may want to use one over the other. And that's what I want to, the whole point of the video, not so much as a tutorial, more of a rant, is to just to get you thinking about when you're out taking those photos, whether, quote, proper exposure is the best way to go for this scene, for the given um, dynamic range in the scene and exposure latitude of your camera, or is underexposure better for this scene with the given, given dynamic range in the scene and the exposure latitude of your camera, or is overexposed, uh, again, slightly, not necessarily two stops, but for the given dynamic range in the scene and the exposure latitude of your camera, and for what you're going for. You know, what are you going for? Do you want a lot of detail? Do you want to minimize noise? Are you not so worried about noise? You just want to make sure that the highlights aren't blown out. Um, so you got to take that all into account and decide which, um, how you're going to expose that scene. Um, what works best for what you're going for. All right. That's important because all of us are different. And, you know, what are you going for? And what are you trying to achieve? So that's it. Again, uh, Exposed to left is underexposed, and again, it's called that because the histogram is built up over onto the left. Exposed to the right is overexposed. Uh, again, it says that because the histogram is pushed to the right. And properly exposed usually will have uh, even distribution of the tones going across um, so that it's not necessarily built up on one side or the other. Thank you, everyone who watches my videos. I really do appreciate it. I'll talk to you guys soon. <laughs>